Hey everybody, this is Death by D4, and this is the story of when I fell in love with a tiefling. There's a lot to go over, so be sure to subscribe and let's dive right on in. So this story comes from the same campaign where I played as my handsome half-elf warlock, Davrian Lucerne. To quickly go over everything that had been going on up until that point, the party and I had just completed our very first quest, and we just decided to head on over to the local guild hall in order to find ourselves some more work to do. Admittedly, we didn't really have to do this, especially since I'd just gotten away with swindling the mayor out of a lot of money, but we needed something to do and it was the easiest way for us to find that. So upon arriving at the guild hall, we found that it was actually a lot bigger than we expected it to be, being this huge and expansive community hub for all sorts of other adventurers. Instantly, a couple of our party's rogues then took off towards the nearby gaming tables to indulge themselves in their gambling urges, and then both of our fighters just decided to follow their stomachs and took off for the canteen to inspect its lunch menu, leaving me there with just one other party member. Well, seeing as this rogue and I had a bit of a tense relationship going on at the moment, we decided to just start looking for the job counter so that way we'd not make the situation any more awkward than it needed to be. Anyway, after we found the jobs counter, we saw that it was being run by a lovely dark-skinned tiefling woman, one who, at the moment, was currently busying herself by by reading a small pocketbook. Quickly, I fixed up my hat and put on a charming smile, and then was instantly pulled away from the counter by my fellow party member, who then told me that they would handle the situation instead. To say the least, Davriad was well known for being a bit of a social butterfly, and had a bit of a reputation of being a flirt when it came to women. So disappointedly, I just nodded in agreement and just allowed my rogue to deal with the matter themselves. Or at least they certainly tried to, because that's not at all what happened. You see, despite their best efforts to do so, our rogue was just not a social character whatsoever, resulting in them being completely unable to garner any reaction from the young tiefling woman. In fact, from what I could tell, she was just blatantly ignoring them, despite their best attempts to try and communicate with her in every possible way. So after watching this circus continue on for a little while, I then stepped up beside the rogue, planted my hand firmly against the side of their face, and just shoved them to the floor, all while seamlessly maintaining my character's charming persona as I did so. To say the least, the rogue hated me for doing this, but the fall kind of knocked them out for a little while, so I was at least in the clear to try my hand at the tiefling instead. Quickly, I pulled out a small strand of ribbon, and then softly laid it across the pages of the pocket book lay between us. Excuse me, miss. I said to her. This works far better than folding down the page corners, I assure you. With this, she finally took notice of me, and then just looked up and gave me this really heated and sharply gaze. Please, miss, I assured her. My colleagues and I only require a moment's worth of your time. If you could please help us, then we'll quickly leave you to your business. Well, after having diffused her for a moment, she then closed her book, set it aside, and asked me what I needed from her. From this point on, we just discussed matters of business together, organizing a new quest for our party to go on involving a manner of beasts outside the city. After that, I then swiftly pocketed the work notice, and then offered the tiefling woman my thanks. She told me not to mention and then quickly reached back for her pocketbook that she'd been reading earlier. At that moment, I then just randomly asked my dungeon master if I actually recognized the book that she was reading, and after a quick history check, I was informed that I did, and it was actually this horribly trashy romance novel akin to Twilight. Well, having heard that, I simply couldn't resist making a point about it, so I went ahead and remarked on how surprising it was to see that she was interested in romance. She then looked back up to me and asked if it was only surprising because she was a tiefling. Of course, I dismissed this remark immediately, and told her that it was merely surprising because she possessed a sharper personality than one traditionally drawn to such a delicate genre. However, in spite of my insistence, she simply replied to me saying that it was best for me not to try and make such assumptions of her, as her kind was not really looked at to be comparable to. Well, upon hearing her say that, I did just quickly step forward, slap my hand down on the book in front of her, and looked fiercely into her eyes. I need not contest with you, miss, I said to her. But well, no matter of blood is an excuse for me to treat you any differently than anyone else. So, unless you wish for me to change that, excuse me while I continue to treat you like the fine lady that you are. Understood? At that point, the tiefling woman just simply gazed up to me with an unreadable expression, one that my dungeon master described to me as a mixture of disbelief and mild alarm. Seeing that, I then removed my hand from her book, stepped away, and apologized for overstepping a bit. However, despite the momentary tension, she then seemed to ignore it and simply asked me for my name. At that point, I then introduced myself as Davrian Lucerin and she replied to me in kind, introducing herself as Coco. So then, in light of this exchange, I then smiled towards her and pulled out a couple of gold pieces that I then handed to her. Well, Coco, I said to her, for when next I return, she'll insist that you find yourself something better to read. After all, I would perish the thought of such a fine woman giving in to such paltry reading. And then with a playful wink, I added, my treat, before I then turned to leave her and rejoined the rest of the party. So then, a quick jaunt around the woods and a couple of dead direwolves later, I then returned to the guildhouse the following day to conduct our usual party business. 
Unsurprisingly, Coco was still there, running the jobs counter like she'd done the day before. And as expected, she was once again buried deep into one of her pocketbooks. However, I was surprised to actually notice that she was in fact reading a different book this time around. That said, I didn't recognize this one, but I did commit the title to memory and decided to inquire about it for later. So after putting on another one of my infamously charming smiles, I walked up to Coco and caught her attention. Swiftly, she then closed up the book in front of her and tucked it away beneath the counter, but not quick enough before my sharp and delish eyes spotted the ribbon that I'd given her the previous day tucked away between its pages. At that point, I then went about collecting the party's bounty and grabbing ourselves another job for us to do later. Once those matters were out of the way, I then took a moment to give her another charming smile and asked her if she'd put my gold pieces to good use yet. She then laughed softly at me and admitted that she had and thanked me very much for the gold. I told her that it had been my pleasure and that I hoped that she enjoyed her new book. Then, with the tip of my hat, I then wished her well with the rest of the day and bid myself adieu. However, just before I left, she then quickly called out to me and asked if I had been needing a room for the evening, to which I then kindly replied to her that my party and I were already staying in a tavern just north of the city. But I thanked her for her concern before making my way back to the party with our earnings. Now, after completing that quest, which, if I recall, was the whole story surrounding the Succubus Twins, my party and I then returned to the guild hall together to rake in our new sizable reward. Similar to before, most of the other party members then just dispersed to indulge themselves in their particular interests, leaving me on my own this time to actually conduct businesses with Coco. Oh well, it's not like I was going to complain at this point. That said, to my utter disappointment, I found that Coco actually wasn't running the jobs counter that day, and instead it was just some other human woman that I had never met before. Well, I still had a job to do, so I then put on a good smile and then stepped up to greet her. However, before I got a word out to her, she then suddenly started putting away her ledger and completely ignoring me entirely. After asking her what was going on, she then told me that her shift was over and that I should try coming back the following day. Of course, I then tried to persuade her into trying to help me anyway, but then to my incredible surprise, Coco came out of nowhere and swiftly shoved the woman out of the way, offering me then a forced smile alongside of her services. At that moment, I then noticed the other woman just glaring daggers at the two of us, but after she noticed that I was watching her, she then turned away and left us be. I then saw Coco sigh a bit with relief and, after exchanging some greetings with one another, we then got down to our usual business. A short while later and after securing ourselves our new reward, Coco asked me if there was anything else that she could help me with. Of course, there really wasn't anything I could think of at the time, but I did take a moment to ask Coco about the whole incident involving the other clerk from earlier. Apparently, that woman was just a bit of a racist towards non-humans, and after seeing that she wasn't going to help me, Coco decided to then just step in for my sake. To say the least, I was immensely appreciative of that, but I couldn't help but shake a little bit of worry for whatever was going to come towards Coco from that spiteful woman. So in part of my concerns for her well-being, I then offered her to take one of my succubi familiars, that way she could watch over her. That said, Coco was quick to refuse this offer at first, but after some very careful insistence on my part, she then eventually agreed to it. When next I saw her, I then took back the familiar, but thankfully all of my concerns had been for nothing. Still, it certainly allowed me to sleep a little bit easier at night knowing that she was absolutely going to be alright. Now, at that point, I believe the next interaction that Coco and I had at the time was when I'd asked her out on a date to the festival, which I've already done a video on before. However, there is one thing I'd like to say about that whole event that I unfortunately omitted from my original video, something that actually led to a few arguments in my comments sections. You see, at some point earlier on, a changeling dancer named Rin had slowly become a more prevalent character over the course of the campaign. However, despite being well-liked by most of the party, Davrian very clearly did not like Rin at all. And as I had stated in one of my other videos, Davrian had even gone as far as to threaten Rin's life, and had even plotted to kill her after she got transformed into the evil villain. Well, because of this, many of you were curious or confused as to why exactly I hated Rin to begin with, especially since I had admitted talking about her a lot during those videos. Well, allow me to just quickly tell you exactly why I hated Rin, and something that I admitted from my video of when I ditched my party to date a tiefling. You see, back when Coco and I were on our date at the festival, and we decided to step out into the festival plaza to dance together, I had been able to catch a glimpse of Rin hidden somewhere within the crowd. Kinda made sense for her to be there, what with her being a dancer and all. Up until this point, the two of us had really grown to dislike each other, but neither of us had done anything to directly harm each other up until this point either. Well, after having caught me off romancing a woman on my own, Rin then decided to do the unthinkable thing and cast Lightning Bolt at the two of us. Yes, you heard me right. She cast lightning bolt at me and an innocent civilian right in the middle of a crowded festival plaza. Of course, I did the only reasonable thing a person could do at this given situation, and I cast Counterspell on it, to which I was then successful and I dispelled the lightning bolt into a harmless array of tiny sparks. At this point, I then utilized the sparks as a flourish to my dance with Coco, trying my best to disguise the whole event as much as possible so as not to alarm the other civilians. To say the least, both Coco and the crowd were quite at awe at the moment, 
make it all the more spiteful back at Rin to watch. And of course, I made a good point of looking back towards her and giving her the smuggest smile I could possibly give her. So, uh, yeah. For those of you that were wondering exactly why I hated Rin so much, that's basically the entire reason why. In hindsight, I could have mentioned this in that other video, but I was trying really hard to tell a cohesive story as much as possible. And I'm sure that you're all aware that most Dungeons & Dragons sessions are anything but cohesive stories. Anyway, enough about Rin, let's just get back to Coco. Sometime after our date, I ended up visiting the guild hall with one of my other party members. To say the least, I had been holding back on visiting the guild hall for a little while now, mostly because Coco had just kissed me on the cheek when last we'd been together. And despite whatever you might think about Davrian's character, but the idea of him seeing her again really made her nervous. Why? Well, despite his usually flirty persona, Davrian had actually never formed a meaningful relationship with another woman in his entire life. In fact, to put it extremely bluntly, Davrian was still a virgin. So his heart would get kind of all into a wretched mess whenever he started thinking about Coco from this point on. That said, was I expecting Coco to also be a bit shy when seeing me? Yeah, but that's besides the point. I just really didn't know what to expect from her from this point on. So with my party taking notice that I was acting way out of character than usual, one of my rogues then decided to drag my sorry ass down to the guild house and resolve the matter once and for all. Did it go as I expected it to? Uh, no, because of course it never does. So when I walked into the guild house, I was immediately greeted by Coco, who appeared to be watching the door like a hawk. Upon greeting her in kind, she then leaned over the counter towards me, accentuating her uh, <laughs> most desirable assets to me, and asked me if there was anything that she could do for me today. At that point, Davrid's brain just sort of melted, and upon seeing me get all flustered in this sort of way, a rogue then stepped in between us in order to keep us kind of on track. A short while later, and once our usual party business was taken care of and the tensions had cooled a little bit, we then got prepared to say goodbye to Coco and return to the rest of the party. However, before we did, Coco then leaned even further across the counter and asked if I could spend the day with her instead of attending to our newly acquired quest. In hindsight, I really should have said yes to this, but seeing as the party rogue was standing literally right there beside me, I instead opted for the responsible answer and said no. However, upon seeing how disappointed this made Coco, along with being telepathically berated by my familiars for telling me I was a sissy, I then used my own telepathy to ask Coco where she lived. After she told me, I then quickly promised that I would visit her after sundown once all of my business had been taken care of. Excited by this, she then returned to give me one of her lovely smiles, and before our rogue could catch on what the heck I was doing, I then bid her farewell we returned to the rest of the party. So then, after a very long day of nearly dying multiple times to wretched phase spiders, like I said in hindsight I really should have just ditched my party again, I then broke off from the party as we walked back into town and snuck off to see Coco. From what I can best describe, Coco's residence was this small, single-story house tucked away near the edge of the city slums. Which, although it wasn't the nicest place by any stretch of the imagination, was still plenty for somebody like her to get by with. Lightly, I knocked upon the door and, after a short moment later, I was eagerly greeted by her smiling face once more. Or at least I was, until she knows the state that I was in, and then she became horribly concerned for me. Upon this, she then quickly ushered me inside and told me to tell her everything that had happened. Well, after taking a seat beside her and tossing my hat by the door, I then gave her the best retelling of events that I could without making myself sound entirely like a pathetic loser. After my story concluded, Coco then gently took a hold of my chin and began to closely examine the wounds across my face. At that point, I was then alarmed to realize that Coco was actually dressed up in this very nice cream-colored nightgown, all of which did everything to make Davrian's cheeks burn with the ferocity of a newborn's illness. So in a pathetic attempt to try and keep my cool, I just held my eyes away from her for the time being and just allowed her to do whatever she was doing. Upon finishing her examination, Coco then quickly got up for a moment before returning with a small healer's kit, intent on helping ease some of my pain from my earlier encounter. However, what caught me a bit off guard was that she then just casually instructed me to take off my shirt. Instantly, I just sort of refused to do this, but then she gave me one of those, uh, condescending looks only a woman can give you, and simply told me that she would be able to tend to my wounds properly if I didn't do so. Well, unbeknownst to her, there was actually a completely different reason of why I was trying to keep my shirt on, and it wasn't just to avoid the obvious sexual tensions rising in the moment. You see, Davrin used to be an ex-cultist, and as a part of having been one, his body was just heavily tattooed with an array of eldritch iconography. And in all honesty, this was something that he'd been attempting to hide from almost everybody for the entire campaign. So knowing that, I didn't want Coco to actually see them. However, despite my wishes, not to mention the fact that I had a sorry excuse for a strength check at that particular moment, Coco was able to overpower me and rip my shirt off. Tragic, I know. Well, to say the least, as she then looked down upon my heretical torso, I just sort of waited there in silence for her response. In vain, I kinda just hoped that the sight of seeing me shirtless was enough to distract her from all of the Eldritch tattoos everywhere, Well, that was just a hopeless thought in general. So after spending a moment to take it all in, Coco then just asked me why I looked the way that I did. And seeing as that I wasn't about to use magic to try and get out of this one, I then decided to confide to Coco Davrin's backstory. 
You see, Davriel was born into a cult that worshipped an elder god residing deep within the Far Plains. Ever since his birth, his parents had just locked him up away in isolation, tutoring him strictly in the ways of their cult and their elder god, all just so that he could become the cult's next suitable archpriest. This was his entire life for nearly two decades. And to say the least, he was a very, very different person during that time. However, mere days before his inauguration, something would happen to him that would finally make Davrian to what he was today. You see, at some point around two or three years ago, Davrian's mother had come to him and instructed him to perform a sacrifice directly to their elder god. Apparently, they had discovered an unfaithful servant hidden deep within their cult's ranks. And seeing as I was essentially this mindless pawn for them, Davrian just agreed to do it without a moment's hesitation. Well, upon performing the sacrifice and hurling their unfaithful traitor into the jaws of their eldritch god, Davrian then realized that he had just sacrificed his own father. Yes, apparently Davrian's father had begun to turn rogue against the cult, or perhaps he'd been an agent working against them this entire time. Either way, the shock of this whole event, let alone the horror of watching one of his own family members then be torn maddenly apart by an elder god, was far too much for his mind to bear. And where most would have otherwise lost their minds, Davrian instead gained a clarity of self unlike any other. And stricken by his newfound sanity, and unable to bear with the grief of what he had just done, Davrian then fled from his cult, never to return. Since then, he's been on the run from them, hiding himself under the guise of his false name and persona, and until recently, he never really bothered even staying in the same town for longer than a few days. Well, now having finished telling Coco my backstory, I simply sat there as she continued to patch me up and waited for her response. To say the least, honestly, I didn't know what she was going to think about me, especially since cultists weren't exactly liked anywhere in this known world. However, maybe in part with her being a tiefling, and maybe knowing kind of what it felt to be hated by most of society, she instead offered me a hug, to which I returned to her in kind. A moment later, after she pulled herself away from me, she then looked up into my eyes and asked me sincerely what my real name was. Shakily, I then leaned across towards her and whispered it to her, Datris Eladriel. And with that, the rest of my night then swiftly faded into darkness, as Coco then pulled me away off from the couch and led me over towards her bedside, to where I then proceeded to have a very pleasant end of my day. Now, some number of days after this event happened, when the party and I were then in the midst of doing a shopping trip together, I then took a moment to peek my head into a nearby bookstore to check out something that I'd forgotten to do for a long time now. You see, I was still curious to know exactly which pocketbook that Coco had bought for herself using the gold pieces I'd given her so long ago. So I then stuck myself into the bookshop in hopes of discovering that. Well, fortunately for me, they had just the book that I was looking for, and after quickly getting the synopsis of it, I was somewhat disappointed to learn that it was just another trashy romance novel. However, what did catch my attentions about this one was the fact that the main characters that were in love were a half-elf man and a tiefling woman. Well, in light of this discovery, I made my way out of the bookstore and over to a jeweler shop. Before I knew it, I was holding a silver ring adorned by a yellow topaz in the palm of my hand. Certainly not what I would consider to be the flashiest engagement ring, but I saw the coloration matching perfectly with Coco's darkened skin and her golden eyes. At this point, I really didn't know when I was going to give it to her, but after everything that we've been through up to this point so far, I just felt there was really no denying what Davrian wanted at this point. And beyond that, the following events that transpired were largely summarized in my video when I proposed to a tiefling. And of course, the tiefling that I proposed to was Coco. And she eagerly accepted me into marriage. However, I'm sure many of you have one last burning question left in your minds now. Did Davrian and Coco actually end up getting married? Well, um, unfortunately, no, not entirely. You see, to everyone's misfortune, the campaign was forced to end prematurely due to the initial outbreak of the 2020 pandemic. Yep, real life just happened to get in the way of that one. However, I can say this much. Due in part to my Dungeon Master filling me in on all the details after the fact, I can say with absolute certainty that he planned on ending the campaign with Davrian and Coco's wedding, allowing everybody involved then to sign off on a triumphant victory with this heartfelt engagement. So, though it never formally came to pass, and there isn't much of a story to tell of the actual event itself, I can at least assure all of you listening that both Davrian and Coco were able to live happily ever after. And that's it! If you liked the video, then be sure to subscribe and let me know what you think down in the comments below. And if you'd like to have the chance to play D&D with me, then feel free to join my Discord server, and consider supporting me over on Patreon. Thank you all so much for watching, I'll see all of you in the next video.